Think of it like this. Humans are arguably the least well-adapted species on the planet. We have to build homes and wear clothes to regulate our temperature enough for our climates. We have to cook for most of our calories and our children are vulnerable for the many years it takes for them to mature. But our greatest skill is communication and communication with other humans. In fact, this is the oldest type of learning conducted and taught by every culture, how to talk and even in some cases write, often called rhetoric. Rhetoric is sometimes simply just dismissed as the art of arguing, but it's more than that. It's how we use our one adaption. It's how we communicate, how we convince others to agree, to express our needs and our wants. It's how we use language and other symbols to influence behaviors and beliefs. It's our communication choices and their consequences, whether they be good or bad. It's how we influence using our own agency through strategy to affect power. In Western culture, one of the foremost scholars of rhetoric is the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle. Originally, Rhetoric referred to just oral speech, but think of it more as a text, anything used to communicate by humans. And one of the heuristics he uses, or lenses to deconstruct it, is to think of it as three appeals, ethos, pathos, and logos. Think of an appeal to ethos as your character or credibility, how likely your audience is to believe you or trust what you're telling them. Pathos is your use of experience and emotion to connect with them on a more visceral level. And logos is your logic, your grounds for reasoning, how you make your persuasion come through. If you're trying to convince someone to partner with you on a future project, you might use ethos to convey your years of experience or your learning in the area to make yourself sound more reliable and trustworthy. You might use metaphor or analogy. In fact, figurative language is one of the ways humans communicate experiences that aren't universal. You might use anecdotes or stories of past triumphs or tribulations, something they can connect with on an emotional level. Or you might use logos, show statistics, facts, or even just rationality. If this thing happens, then this does. Sometimes logos can be a little bit misleading. People might think that facts are more persuasive than emotion, which isn't necessarily true. Keep in mind that all of this is subjective. It depends on how you utilize these things. A rhetorical situation is more complicated than that. You can't just look at these three factors. You know that there must be other things that affect the rhetoric. You can think of this as a rhetorical ecology. It's more of an ecosystem. Things work together, not disconnected. To analyze the different aspects of a rhetorical ecology, you might need to start first with the exigence. This is easier to think of as the spark. What is the thing that caused this rhetoric to be necessary? What brought it into existence? What is it about? Why is it needed? What is it trying to accomplish? Nothing exists within a vacuum. One of the foremost examples of excellent rhetoric in American history is Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech from the Civil Rights March on Washington from the 1960s. Of course, it's a little bit easier to think about what this spark might have been. Racial oppression had reached a critical mass in front of a newly televised culture. It was necessary. Something needed to change. While the march had been planned, this speech was not. It was off the call of Mahalia Jackson encouraging him to give the I Have a Dream speech, and not even one that was prepared for that day. But of course, you also must think about the rhetor, or sometimes just easier to think about it as the speaker, but often they could be writing or drawing. Who is responsible for the text, but also who sponsors or supports it? Who's contributing to its production and delivery? And whose ethos is it highlighting or minimizing? In this case, of course, the rhetor was Martin Luther King Jr., but he wasn't talking in a vacuum. 
this was part of a whole organized march of people who had similar beliefs. His role as a figure of the civil rights movement does help the ethos of the speech. People are already poised to listen to him and to hear what he has to say. Beyond that, think about the audience. Who is involved in the rhetorical situation? Who's the author's apparent target audience, but who else might encounter the text? A speech of this kind is really moving for the people that are there who are already bought in to the, the belief system. But if you think about it, who else are the receivers of the text, especially in a time when we can record and show things on the television, of which would have been quite a new thing for this period of time? So the target audience has actually expanded beyond who would have immediately encountered it. And of course, it's important to keep in mind the purpose, the intent. What's the meaning? What is it designed to do? And what does the writer want the audience to believe or do afterwards? Of course, this purpose is multifaceted. Martin Luther King Jr. is not the only one who believes these ideas of equality in American society. However, the usage of a dream, something everyone can connect to, as not only a goal, but a metaphor for the progress that can be made is very impactful in getting across the meaning to a wider audience. But it's helpful also to remember the context. Think about that rhetorical ecology. What are the outside and internal factors that are influencing it? How might audiences respond? What's going on in the world around it? During this time of American history, when not only politically, but culturally, civil rights advancements were being met with varying degrees of acceptance. Might it been helpful to understand that this is also a time of expanding technology, the space race, more people being able to get more information faster, quicker, larger categories of it. Maybe the I Have a Dream speech wouldn't have been as influential if not for all these external influences. But beyond that, you have to think about the genre. Not just the category, like a genre of book, like science fiction or fantasy, but the mode. Genre here might be a book, a movie, a speech, a note, an invitation. Think about the norms or the constraints. What kind of text is being called for? What are the conventions of the genre? What are the audience expecting? How might changing the norms influence the actual rhetoric being used? So why did Martin Luther King choose a speech? Why not just write it? Why not publish a book? Letter from Birmingham Jail was a series of articles authored by Martin Luther King and published in a newspaper. Why not do that? The choice of using a speech is important. Not just being spawned to write something, not just being part of the March on Washington, but specifically a speech. You can think of genre theory as emphasizing that genres have a specific purpose and follow a specific pattern, a specific pattern. They shape audience expectations and they sort of give you a strategy to approach something and they reflect an evolving social context. They're malleable. Think about the conventions, what things people might expect, and then also the variations where they deviate. If you're thinking of rhetoric as the what, how, and why we communicate, the rhetorical situation or rhetorical ecology is everything that surrounds that text. While not the be all and end all, you can use the acronym SOAPS to help remind you of things you should be thinking of when addressing rhetorical situations and genre theory. This is just a heuristic, a tool. SOAPS as an acronym stands for subject, occasion, audience, purpose, and subject. Who's speaking? What's their ethos? What is the occasion or the external context? Who are they speaking to? Who's their audience? And how are they trying to connect with them emotionally? What is the purpose, the meaning, and what sparked it in that moment? And also the subject matter and the genre that's most appropriate for it. Think of the logos. What's the most effective way to convey that reasoning? Rhetorical analysis is simply a tool, but an effective tool to not only understand how others communicate, 
but also to use the tools and techniques to figure out how to communicate more effectively yourself. Even thinking of it outside of the world of argumentation or persuasion, rhetoric is really helpful to think about simply interactions between people. After all, it is the one thing we can do as humans. Consider playing games. Every culture has them and always has. We figure out how to connect with each other, how to strategize, how to plan moves, maybe how to obscure or emphasize certain things. At the end of the day, it's all just rhetoric.